I was listening to some music and this fellow comes on and tells me about leaky gut. How my gut is leaky. There's gaps between my cells in my gastroesophageal system, the GI tract. Uh, this is the, the tube that goes from our mouth, the esophagus, stomach, wraps around the uh, colon, intestines. We're basically hollow. We have a tube running through us, and that's where absorption takes place. Well, I listened, and I thought, is this scientific? How do I know if this is science or some kind of sales talk or myth? Well, science is, is a method, all right? It's not just a bunch of words. It's not a bunch of facts. It's about a process. It's not always harmless. Um, good example, the Tuskegee study done back in 1932, Macon County, Alabama. The intent, and I'm going to quote from the uh, sources here, to study the effects of untreated syphilis on the Negro male. All right. Untreated because back in the 1930s, we did not have a cure. This is a sexually transmitted disease that these men had acquired on their own. And then... Um, they're diagnosed and given medical treatment and checkups. It seemed like a good study at first, but we're going to gradually tear it apart. At one point in the 1940s, the antibiotic penicillin was discovered. And we finally had a treatment for syphilis. But the syphilis subjects were not treated for their infection. All right, and that violates the... Uh, uh, cause no harm clause in medicine and science. Okay, so what is science? I talked about it's a method. We start with the observation. Scientists are good observers. And if we see something, and you don't have to wear a lab coat to be a scientist. I worked in the Amazon rainforest with Mercedes and other scientists. And um, we were working on cancer cures. And these are scientists because they make good observations. And if no one has done what they're doing, it's new, then they guess what's going on. That's called a hypothesis. So we're on to the second step, scientific method. It's a temporary guess or explanation. It has to be testable. Okay, we can't just say, well, you know, I, I think it's this way and you don't have any way of testing it. Because that's not really scientific. Now we have to do an experiment. And experiments, uh, that's where a lot of times things go wrong. So look, look at this Tuskegee study. All right. These uh, farmers, they were told conflicting information about the study. Uh, some of them believed it was good, beneficial, and they were going to be cured. Others thought it was a manipulative sort of activity by the government. And so each one of them had a different view, and that could be considered extraneous. Okay, any kind of variable that's going to influence outcomes is a is a problem placebo effect if we believe something's going to work beliefs are very powerful and they can influence results so we try to control for these sorts of situations I like the double blind because in double blind the patient and the researcher are both uh, in the dark okay they don't know what's going on and that reduces bias. I also like random samples because you know, in this case, the Tuskegee study, there's no control groups. There was no, like, uh, it was one population. It was very convenient. It was very focused. But you did not get a good broad sample. So what is a control group? That is the one that is not given the treatment. All right. Now, it sounds like a bad deal, huh? You're going in for a, some sort of experiment, and you get the dud. You get the sugar pill. But we need a control group so that we can control for the placebo. All right. Because if they think, hey, I'm getting a good medicine, and it's not medicine, and it works, then we think, well, okay, <laughs> we've got a problem here. Good question here. This guy came on when I was listening to music also, and he told me about juicing and the, how amazing micronutrients are. 
All right, we're going to take a look at that. Because, okay, let's, let's talk about experimental or test group. These are the ones that are getting the treatment. So in the green juice study, I mean, uh, don't get fooled by advertisements because what can he test? What is testable? He can't measure the absorption of those micronutrients. This is what's called a test tube study. He tries to predict what will happen based on what happens in other lab experiments. So what is measurable in this green juice thing? Well, if you chew rather than juice, you're going to develop your muscles. So if you look at someone who chews their food, they have good muscle mass. But if you go to a senior center where they're eating puddings and jello, you're going to see sunken in cheekbones, weak musculature. So I could measure the zygomaticus, which is kind of the smiling muscle, the masseter, which is a major chewing muscle, depressor anguli oris. And my guess is eating traditional foods and chewing them is far more powerful than the green juice. All right, I'd love to do that study. Results. All right, here we, we uh, kick in with some mathematical statistics. And in doing so, we want to basically get a standard deviation, which is the, here I'll show you in my graph. In one of my studies on monkey arthritis, these bars on the graph will show how reliable that average is or mean. If you have a small standard deviation, say it's only 0.05, that means you have 95% confidence. And it means only 5% chance that the results are due to like some kind of random extraneous variable that I talked about earlier. Yes, yoga is science. All right, it's measurable. The benefits clearly measurable. It's kind of cool how you know some people think science is really boring and it's not. Okay, theories. Theories are based on observation, hypothesis, experiment, and now we're ready to make some pretty powerful statements. It has to be consistent over time. But you know what? Theories are not facts. Now I have a note here: science can be dangerous because Okay, if people are believing the leaky gut story, then what if this gentleman has pain in the lower right quadrant and he decides to drink a beverage instead of going to a, a doctor? If he ends up with appendicitis, he might die from that. Okay, so uh, some of these sales people, they're um, causing trouble. Okay, so is leaky gut a theory? Our intestines are permeable, okay? That's part of their job. That's normal. I don't call that leaky. But in some people that have celiac disease, uh, which is when there are, okay, there, there, there are some uh, food substances coming through. Or let's say they have diverticulitis, which is a little pouches along the intestine. I mean, that could be considered leaky, but we don't call it leaky. We have specific names, celiac or diverticulitis or peritonitis, whatever it is. I know the intestines pretty well. I've dissected a lot of uh, dead human bodies, and it's hard to cut through those intestines. So to think that they're that fragile, that they just leak, is really absurd. Here's a study I, I like. Um, if you're not sure what an ulcer is, it's an irritation to the lining of the mucosa. Okay, so on the inside of the stomach, in the intestines, there's a glandular mucosa. And if you get an irritation there, it's called an ulcer. And it, and it can be dangerous if it perforates and then the contents of the stomach go into the cavity. Well, the observation was the pathologist saw there was a species of bacteria always hanging around these ulcers. And so he thought, well, what if this bacteria called Helicobacter, or H. pylori for short, what if it has something to do with ulcers? There's a microbe right there. Well, he injected patients, including himself. <laughs> really shouldn't do that, but he did. And he found that uh, a new theory that it's a bacterial based theory. It's not just about like if you eat hot peppers or you're under stress, but there's also bacteria 
that will invade this uh, stomach wall because he injected healthy people with H. pylori, that's the bacterium, and by gosh, they got ulcers. All right, so you can go back to eating your hot peppers <laughs> if you're healthy. Okay. Finally, if we're lucky, a theory that has been consistently supported over time, often many generations of people, okay, it's rare for one person to come up with a, a, a law or principle because that's a fact, okay? We finally get, sometimes after 50, 60 years of research, we finally get to something that we can call a fact. I think back to uh, Jessie Isabel Price and some of her work on ducks, okay? She, she worked with vaccines and new theories, and some of those theories led to our modern day COVID vaccines, such as uh, Moderna, Pfizer, Johnson & Johnson. Okay, those things didn't happen overnight. Some of them came about through generations of scientists. Okay, unfortunately, there's very few facts in science. And, you know, scientists are not bothered about religion, okay? Many scientists are religious, and, and that's, that's not an issue. Because science is about the unbiased search for information, right? Simple as that. No trickery. We don't go for salespeople. We don't go for placebo. We're just trying to figure out what's going on. No lab coats required. <laughs> I mentioned that. All right. Thanks for listening.